<laughs> but before we begin, does anyone have any question about the topic in particular if you'd like to see covered? Or um, anything? Because that makes make the talk more meaningful if you have an idea of what you want. If you do, shout out something along the way. Yeah. This is really superficial because I don't know what people know or don't know. And so I, as, you'll, as you can imagine, trying to uh, reduce the volume of data so great into something that is visually appealing yet truthful to the record is a challenge. So along the way, if I go too fast, let me know. If I go too slow, let me know. I do want to be out in time because the glaring eyes of the people who come in this class, I want. <laughs> kind of pretty game, a little bit. <laughs> so if it's too elementary, let me know, and I'll go deeper. If it's um, too boring, let me know, and I'll try to find something more interesting to show. As far as I'm concerned, it's all fascinating. If you like, we can do it in another language. It's just really fun. I'll keep you on your toes. <laughs> Have you done that before? Something flipped into another language in class and not even realized it? Until you get the looks in your face. <laughs> well, if you're teaching programming, it's always another language. So. <laughs> Obviously, programming is great. It's like being God. You don't need to delete. <laughs> Should we begin? Yep. You're also quiet. I will take your quiet because of dim light and you're tired. <laughs> and you're eating food, I hope. The ACES folk were very kind to co-sponsor today. The slides are online, at least a version of them. The little printouts, too, if you want, are online. Okay. And everybody's welcome to come to LIS 593D, Information Visualization, which is actually right after this class. <laughs> so come in, and you're always welcome to look at the material. They're always online. Sounds good? Let me jump right in. Ta-da! I'm Jerry Binwa. Here are the ACES folks. Thank you. And here are you. You're all here. Welcome. I presume you know nothing or very little about computers, but you want to know more. You are very. You have some interest in the arts. Whether you know it, you are surrounded by them. You see about 3,500 images a day. That's a typical American. If you think about that, how do you filter stuff out and how do you integrate? It's not a trivial question, and it's definitely your future. Part of this is going to be a little rant because I think the power dynamics of computing have to be changed. And the only way to change it are you people. So at the end, if you're throwing things out the window, I mean it. If you're so ripped up, I will have done my job. That makes me very happy. Very quickly, what is this? <clears throat> Boston. It is a map. No, it's San Francisco. Oh, really? What do the blue things mean? No. no. Streets. No. Earthquakes. No. <laughs> uh, stuff bike. under the street somehow. You're, you have the right concept, yeah. but the wrong preposition. Sewer? If not under, electrical lines. Closer. O over. Telephone? Population density? Um, it well, does look that hey, way. And that wi -Fi. actually could be attractive. She got it. Wi Fi, right? It's IP address. IP address. Ah. That's kind of interesting. What the heck is this? Uh, I'm going to give you some definitions in a moment. Believe it or not, that's Beethoven's fifth. There's someone's <laughs> rendering of it. Yeah. How about this up here? As we'll see in a moment. It is deliberately not in English because it doesn't have to be. When you move to the world of information visualization, you are actually moving to another language. All right, today's talk. I'm going to do our visual world, talk about literature and definitions, because there are many. Hi, James. Um, and the process of it. I have superficial descriptions of the process, but we can get into more depth, depending on the time. Data, models, and tools, you should know about those anyway. And then some of the trends and the issues. This is when you guys come back in again. And how it is your future. It's also how you fit in. And then some references and some hopefully questions at the end. Sounds good? Now, because I like to talk too, too much, unless I over go on. What is this, by the way, before we begin? What is this? You might know. You can't read it. Of course I know. Binary code. It is. Can you tell me what the message says? That's this a, is that's Benoit's class in information visualization. No, but this would be a great 49 <laughs> quiz, wouldn't it? To find. The this is actually something for Laura. This is binary, and it says, La mire musica, da vero e bella. My music is beautiful, in binary. It's kind of cool. Now imagine if you were facing hordes of data like this. How would you interpret it? How would you know when to stop? What would you do? Even before beginning, is there not an aesthetic quality to the music? Isn't something kind of mesmerizing just by the patterns? 
I think there is. <laughs> I wouldn't want it all day long. <coughs> um, but it's kind of fun. By the way, never look bored. You know, if I speak too quickly, let me know. If you look bored, then I think I have to go even faster. <laughs> okay. This is for Kathy. Something for Laura, now something for Kathy. Unless I ran over and I didn't get to the conclusions, I'm moving to the front. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing is to remember, as we'll see, everything's all over the board. So how do you study how human well, uh, the process of human interpretation. I will underscore, and you should all know this, data are data, information is not data. Information is some data that has been interpreted, some utility has been projected, some meaningfulness is established. That's the big difference. Otherwise, it's just static data stores until they have a purpose to help people act more efficiently or effectively in their daily lives. That's information. So information is the interpretation of data? It is, the, yeah, it's, it, but it is the result of cognition. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's the result of affectiveness. Mm -hmm. These are important because most studies of the old world, Colin Weir is a good example, <laughs> and his other book, this is his more CS version of the book, and here's the popularized version of the book, <laughs> focus on people as being a black box of input and output, how people respond. And essentially, you're measuring the reaction of the quality of the data, transformation, to information through proxy, by a proxy. That's perfectly fine. That's how scientific method writ large works. It is an aspect of, I would call, the strong period <coughs> program. That's not a problem. Affective. If you can't study the black box of the mind, what can you do about the reactions? Eye tracking software does this all the time. There's a famous study, which I think is hysterical, from the 60s, where college students were asked about their sexual mores and then shown a variety of pictures. They all said one thing to the reviewers, but the eye tracking software showed something very different. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea was, ah, you say one thing, but what you think is another. It looks pretty well ensconced right now. We both require proxy measures. What happens, though, when you drift towards um, information visualization, you're really supporting, through statistical techniques, often decision making. This is often, often part of business more than anything else. Oh, good so far? <coughs> Next thing you have to know is what do you have to work with? You don't have people to talk to, so what evidence do you have? I don't. You only have data. That's the first thing. What kind of data? I didn't finish drawing over here, um, but you have semantic tokens that are extracted from documents. For example, here's a document with some words in green. The words are extracted, and they become tokens. The linguistic aspect is often thrown away, so it's only the surface level of language that's included most of the time. And then you have to have some reason for the relationship. If you're looking for something in medicine, you want myocardial infarction, and maybe you want you know, a certain drug interaction, you would look for that. If we were looking for what doctor to go to, we would view those data very, very differently. These rationales do affect the concept of truthfulness of it, but they also affect the value of what you're looking for. Next is the display of the data. Keep in mind, as you know, even if you've done only HTML4, that the data are separate from the presentation of the data. This is a cardinal rule of today's computing. Very important. The next then, you will have to interpret it, which are essentially moving into another language. How do you interpret it? Which we'll get to next in a moment. But this interpretation element is what converts the data to information, but how are you going to do it? As we'll see later on, it's often done to explain a phenomenon, what happened on that street, for example, how to predict something, what will happen, and then how to discover something. There's a great example from Ben Schneiderman at the University of Maryland when they did a movie database and all the data were thrown in willy-nilly. And what happened in the visualization were these little yellow lines would show up, as you know, mm -hmm. um, between some of the nodes. And no one could figure out what it was. They thought it was a bug. And it turns out by investigating the links between the data and the little yellow lines, it turns out those were movies filmed in a particular county that had drugs as a theme. Now imagine planning a database for that question. <laughs> well, so what looked like a bug turned out to be something they had no idea before. Okay? Now, from my point of view, at this point, data mining and text mining are really no different than information retrieval. We just different domains of work focus on different things, but really from a computational point of view, right now, they're the same. You may not agree by it, but I just think it is. <coughs> the next thing is you can add extra textual data. A lot of these projects just pull out data from the documents, that's what makes an IR question. You answer your different questions that were anticipated, makes it a data mining question. We're going to add other metadata. 
This is where we're heading. This is where again, you come in. And finally, there's such an emphasis on the volume of data, of big data, that you have to move to a different language, a visual language, so you can get a lot of data into a single domain, but how do you present it all in a 2D plane? That's an interesting question. So you need to learn about languages, uh, visual languages. Some techniques are common. This one, for example, a, a cloud moving in 3D, and the rendering suggests the 3D, but the fourth dimension is time. <coughs> And since, since it's a static image, we can't have something moving through time, you have to suggest it. In that case, it is a generative metaphor. It implies to the mind, or infers something, and then you have to interpret it. Okay. So the visual languages are also highly systematized. Jacques Bertin, B-E-R-T-I-N, has this whole dictionary, essentially, of the elements that are needed. Daniel Kein, K-E-I-M, from Germany, has written a tremendous book outlining all the little prim <coughs> visual primitives that you can use. That's your language base. But these people do not talk to each other. And a great example is to look at information and visualization conference papers. Because you find hardcore CS people, computer scientists, bumping into something that looks like art. But they create the principles from scratch. If you know uh, the modern artist Mondrian, what his work looks like with squares, there's a man from, I think, Drexel, who did a visualization project, never once mentioning Mondrian or modern art or even art. But his visualization looks exactly like something from the <coughs> 1930s by Pete Mondrian. So either he's being accidental or he's misleading us. Um, so these guys don't talk about, to, they don't talk much to each other. So we need to encourage an aesthetic appreciation. Aesthetics is not just the study of art or the relationship of art and philosophy. It's often used very casually to refer to all things visual. <coughs> that's fine on a casual level, but that's not the vision for us right now. So far so good? Okay, here's part of the power aspect. Write your own software. It's very easy. Modern computing has made it so that you can use anyone's tools. Raphael, JS, Neo, J3, all these wonderful tools that are out there. If you know cascading style sheets, if you know a little XML, if you know HTML5, you don't have to be under somebody else's thumb when it comes to creating your own visualization. They may not be a whiz bang, and they may not be competition great, but they'll be yours, and you will control the data, and you will understand it better. Say something. Like, you're out of your mind. <laughs> 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 there are a lot of proprietary software that are out there. And this is great and all, but don't forget, you might end up inheriting accidentally the bias and error of uh, the, the models that are done. <coughs> good so far? Mm -hmm. Now, the real issue is, what's going to happen? Who's going to decide for, the, for you? Right now, Harvard is going through a whole examination of its online systems to see whether or not they can move from discovery, excuse me, from searching to discovery. <coughs> so this is a great idea, but the library has to be trained, essentially, what it means. Finally, okay, some literature and definitions. Um, what is it? It is the representation of abstract phenomena. This is a very important point. It is not scientific data. If you had of data that represented a mosquito, for example, and you study the software and not look like a mosquito, that's scientific data. That's not scientific visualization. Information visualization is the, app, is the representation through visual language of an abstract phenomenon. That's really important. But the lines are blurring in very significant ways. Here's some definitions that have changed over the years. 1999. The use of computer-supported interactive visualization of abstracted data to amplify <coughs> cognition. That's pretty famous by Card, many of you know. Here's one from 2004. Information and visualization is an increasingly important subdivision of human-computer interaction. Focuses on graphical mechanisms designed to show the structure of information and improve the cost of access to large data repositories. In printed form, information visualization has included the display of numerical data, bar charts, pie charts, plot charts, combinatorial relations, drawings of graph, and geographic data. Computer-based systems such as the information visualizer and dynamic queries have added interactivity in new visualization techniques, 3D animation. <coughs> well, that's way too big. Here's a name you should know, Cho Mei Chen at Drexel. Visual representation of the semantics or meaning of information in contrast to scientific visualization. Information visualization typically deals with non-numeric, non-spatial, and high-dimensional data. I don't agree. There is non-numeric data involved, and there is non-spatial data involved, but it's definitely high-dimensional data. <coughs> the definitions vary, and they vary by the trajectory of the, of the history of a particular group. You'll find it, for example, in medical informatics, a very different point of view. 
these people, the analysts, let's do it ourselves because no one else is playing, let's go. And over the years, the emphasis has been on the computational aspect of it at Brown University, for example, but increasingly biologists, people in medical, uh, biomedical work, will use a lot of the free libraries available from, from Java for creating their own tools. Sounds good? So here's your opportunity to be a translating bridge, essentially. <coughs> Here we go. Here, what is this? This is an example of baseball, believe it or not. <laughs> it's two-dimensional data, fish and I, and you can tell from the names who's hitting what, how you can interpret it. Would you want to work with that? No. No. So the first answer is how do I show multi-dimensional data, in this case 2D, <coughs> in a 2D plane in a way that people will understand? So the first assumption is that people have some background knowledge of visualization, so typically a 2D plane with an X and a Y coordinate. But look how the data overlap. So now it sort of moves into a visual question. How about this? Ugly as can be. The second takeaway from this then is how the technology that's available affects materially what you can do. <coughs> you can have the idea, but then you can what you can do. And you can all tell that this is a sun system from a long time ago <laughs> by the interface. But they're trying. You get the idea of something is linked, and you get the idea also of relationships. Whatever these properties are somehow related to this thing. So this is, um, in some way, a visual representation of the reduction of dimensional space. How can I filter data down to a meaningful subset? What happens when the computing power gets ramped up? And you can show little images more clearly. And you can add little labels more clearly. What is the other purpose of this? To find something quickly? Or to understand a phenomenon more quickly? It's rhetorical at this point. There is no answer. <laughs> Or, maybe the old-fashioned way. What if I show the look node and a hinting of a 3D plane by using color, distance, and then weights? In the world of data mining, you're trying to find data that conform to a phenomenon called an interesting event, but data that are anomalies that do not conform. And then you focus on it. Here we go. What's involved? There you go. You sit around talking with your friend and you start making data on a napkin. I have hordes of napkins with great ideas on them. Someday they'll be published. Who knows? <laughs> so this is in Russian deliberately, so you can't read the language. If you knew the English, the Russian, I mean, you would get fixated on what it's trying to say. A visualization that going to somebody in a general audience has no idea how it came about. There it is. So you have to essentially engage with the conversation with yourself about what it could possibly mean. And we do see a check mark, and some X's, so this is probably a no, this is probably a yes. So you're beginning to see how the data cluster <coughs> by some reason. Type it up. Now, here's data that's easily presentable, but very quickly, who used the most resources? Go. You really got to look, don't you? Yeah. 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 Everything has slowed down, hasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if everything has slowed down, you have to actually work <coughs> with the data. And one of the goals is to interpret a large amount of data more quickly. slide one ahead. That's okay. Okay, so here's the um, main idea. You define, can you, do you know, before you begin this, can you know what you want to convey to the people? You are actually creating a message which makes you a responsible agent in the interpretation and delivery of the message. Um, are you explaining a phenomenon? Could you explain the phenomenon of the museum next door? Think about it. Each one of you might have a different answer. Some might talk about the architecture, some might talk about the collections, but they're both legitimate answers. Um, Will you emphasize a section of the data from the whole? Have you ever played a video game? Yes. Yeah, yes, a yes, video yes, game? Yes. Okay, I admit, I played Doom. It makes me nauseated from running through the hallway. But I love it, and I use the cheat codes all the time, because I hate getting killed. But you notice, you can have that little map that shows you where you've been. Because that part-whole relationship is critical, generally, to situate the person where they have been. So you build from the known to the unknown. So you're really kind of inferring. Um, how about you predict the event? If you know anything about regression analysis, the data that you've used, you may plot something, and that looks like correlation. But you really can't go beyond the end of the data. If people do it, that's not how it's going to work. So you actually have to know how to interpret the data, the numbers, as well as the visualization. How about you can expose what's yet undiscovered? I know a man who was one of the funniest guys I've ever met. He studies fish sex. <laughs> <I'm> like, what? <laughs> 
And people are delighted to tell me that when fish have sex, they create a protein in their blood that keeps the blood from coagulating. But when they're done, that protein sort of self-destructs and the blood goes right back to normal. And he's trying to study that in humans. I'd like to see that, re that grant. <laughs> um, the point is, the literature of fish studies, you don't find it in the literature of human mythology. So he's trying to bridge two domains. So he has to create a link somehow between these in order to find what he needs from the literature. I never know if it's advancing slowly and I'm skipping a slide or... Yeah. Okay, very quickly, because I want to move on to the pictures, because they want like pictures. Here's the main thing to keep in your head. What we've done is reduced a great deal of literature into a handful of main points that you can take away with you. So here are the design process involved. There are graphic frameworks that are typically adopted. If you make a web page or use them as a software, you use their template. That means you also still do the interpretation of the data in a way that you may not have uh, considered. That's not a good thing. It is mostly all the communication process. This is fairly new. In 1997, was it? Patty Mays, don't forget, famously said in response to, to uh, Ben Schneidman that we have computer science. We'll tell the user what they want. <laughs> well, the idea of moving away from a state machine to an interactive communications-based machine has been fought tooth and nail, and only recently has the communications model come out. Is it to explain or to entertain? These two are fusing right now. But there is a technical process. So it's not like you can create something. It has to scale up, too. So the computing and the math is going to get involved no matter what. What kind of math? Discrete math is very popular, but there are uh, continuous math models. The continuous ones become very complicated very quickly, and the ones that are 3D and spherical become even more complicated. <coughs> That's something you know. So it's part programming. Programming and scripting, tagging, compression algorithms leads to another field. But essentially, it's algorithm design. And that should be within your can. Now, it's similar, as I said before, this is a recap to get to the pictures. It's similar to knowledge discovery in databases or data mining. There are heterogeneous stores that are integrated over here, and they should be cleansed, essentially, to create some kind of a warehouse. Once again, you make a decision. For example, do you want any null values or zero values in your data? Well, you kind of don't. What if you have some kind of multiplication of division by zero? Everything crashes. One technique is to use what's called the nearest neighbor modeling where you interpret. If that's a five, and that's a five, and that's a five, and this one's empty, I might put a five in there too, just to see. But at least I know how much error I'm putting in. Another model is called a trigram. You stick in a 0 point, 0 0.03 as noise throughout, but so little noise, it doesn't really affect the data. These techniques are actually used in genomics. If you've seen Jurassic Park, they use a frog to drop in to the dinosaur. It's the same idea. <laughs> now, why is this kind of like pornography coming out from behind the closet? Boy, I have a theme in my mind, though. How come? Because back in the day, Large volumes of data were very computationally intense and difficult to use, so you needed a domain specialist, like a doctor or a pharmacist, whatever, you need a statistician, because there are accidents of, of statistics where a trend looks like it's in the data, and computationally looks like it's there, but that could never happen in real life. So, on the match. Okay, spell, okay, to take a, uh, make sure that your spell checker doesn't kick in without paying attention. And then, okay. Now, you identify patterns that suggest meaning, you suggest, and significance to the viewer. This is why in data mining, for example, there's two major approaches. One is called hypothesis generation, one's called hypothesis confirmation. Typically, you have a question, I think it's true that X, Y, and Z, and you test the hypothesis. Another approach is where you have no idea what the data might tell you, and you get beat the heck out of it with computers, and hopefully some statistical model will emerge that leads you to an interesting event. That's good? Now, keep in mind, too, that there are, called, there are what are called semantic tokens. What language, typically, since we have communications model, is semantic at the highest level, syntactic is a structure, and then pragmatic, what you do with it. I love the example of Hemingway. When you get older, all they could say was single words. And my favorite example is saying beer. It was expected that other people would know what the hell he meant by beer. I want a beer, I spilt a beer, don't give me beer, the cat like beer, who knows? So, so a single element may carry a lot, but doesn't carry everything. <coughs> now, take a deep breath. It is old, what's the expression? Old wine and new skins? New skins and old beers, whatever. <laughs> There's always been a need to present a visual where a lot of data are involved. 
You can make lists, for example. People love to make lists, even back into the ancient Greek. Plato had lists, Socrates had lists, they all had lists. What happens when you move into the world of the Enlightenment? You want lists to make people more useful, more helpful. So you have lists like this. This is um, a, a figured system of human knowledge, back when you could actually get all human knowledge. It's <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> a great idea. What do you think this is? Is that the same thing? Or? No, yeah. it is a subset. Is it literature or a tree or something? Well, this is fascinating. It is clearly a tree. So it is using a metaphor, obviously, an arboreal metaphor to show something to grow and these to filter out. And we have leaves on the tree, so you have leaves. Why not have some of these goiters? No, they're actually leaves <laughs> on the tree. Who knows, like an XML parse, why not? This is actually from the uh, Thalambea, the Rose Encyclopedia of Love. That is their figuration of love. Really? <laughs> what a world. Wow. What is this? Oh, we can read it, obviously. Table of alchemy. <clears throat> Astrologue. Oh, it's an 18th century. Okay. It's an 18th century uh, uh, model of chemistry. And the takeaway from this is you see that there are symbolic languages that sort of in-group and out-group language, so you have to have someone to interpret it. The other thing is that there is an, an obvious attempt to make a, an attractive graphic out of it. So when I said about the beautiful aspect of information, it really is beautiful in the way we would look at a graphic art or a fine art. It's also more approachable. If you threw this at an audience, nobody would read it. If you throw this, well, I'll take a look. Are the models labeled? What? Are the models labeled, or is it just purely aesthetics? Um, it's labeled in the text. OK, yeah. This is uh, a book that appeared a few years later, building in the success of the encyclopedia. This is showing you time. I, start, I left the port. We sailed for a long time, apparently. Then we saw a ship. So this is, I've got the tale of it. It's someone a voyage around the world, I think. So the idea is that even though people think visuals are used only for preliterate groups, they're really not. They're bolstered for literate too. Make this go faster, make that go slower. <laughs> okay, I'll show you some more examples. This is how you print. I thought this was great. This is how you could print by pulling type by hand. Here's the stick, and here's what the data would look like in the tray. This is magnificent. This is, looks like dogs tearing something limb from limb. I have no idea. But here are their paws. But the mystery is, it's set to music. <laughs> but there are three different languages here, essentially. But they're all visual. This is the Paris Underground. Fascinating place, especially on a hot summer day with all the tourists. Um, <laughs> here's the idea of, the, of many, many things that you should begin to extract out of any visualization. This image here is two color. To get the part covered here. The map is in two color printing. It's very cheap to do two color printing. It's spot. It's very easy to do. You can print it all day long. That's a technological question. Second, as you can see, well, you might not be able to see, the Seine River is represented fairly realistically as little blue lines flowing. Major buildings that you can't quite see are there as physical landmarks. That's to make it so you can tie to a place in the world and then infer what's underneath it. Here is a transitional chart. It's the same chart, but the printing quality has gone up because printing technology has become cheaper, and you have more area involved. There's some labels to show you where you are, but you're moving more towards an abstract interpretation. There's no longer the reliance on the physical world except to suggest where you are on the planet. However, and this is a very typical progression. Now, the idea, if people know this kind of stuff, they'll throw all the real stuff away and focus on the data. I don't know what you... Still there. What? Isn't the river still there? Well, right, the river still over there. Back in Jacques Chirac, actually. Mm -hmm. that. But all the other landmarks are gone. I still get lost. <laughs> Which is okay. You're in Paris. What the heck? Yeah. Here we go. As a summary, along the way, this is what you need to know. There are data stores. They typically come from these three areas, relational databases, or in XML, or as flat files. But from our point of view, we would treat XML and flat files the same. And ultimately, you integrate all of these into your collection. Design. Keep this in mind. Uh, SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics, is really sort of an SGML implementation. So if you know, know Adobe Illustrator, you can design exactly the information graphic you want with generally a printed static model, and then integrate that into computing. That should rock your world. But all of a sudden, your HTML5 will be from boring to stunning. Um, there are lots of JavaScript libraries we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. And we use them in the 
um, information visualization class, but it's also a lot of full-fledged programming languages. Java, for example, have Java 3D, and also have Java FX libraries that are really cool. The point is, with a little bit of programming and a lot of courage, you can actually integrate this library that will give you far more width value than you can imagine. Now, I'm a big fan of open source. I don't like having to pay for something I can write myself. You, neither should you. The bar has been lowered, not in a negative way, but it's much easier. Oh, Peter, I don't like it. Oh, well, <laughs> sorry, I've got a meeting. Oh, well, I'm fine. <laughs> sorry, Jerry. Um, okay. Okay, what's happening is, I won't get into the moment, but you will see everything is dripping towards the object oriented approach. So you should focus on that, on that in your classes, too. But once you have a little HTML5 under your way from drawing, you can begin to integrate some FPG. And once you begin to move into a PHP, even using PHP in a client server environment, you can begin to manipulate the SVG on the fly. Because trust me, I'm there. <laughs> you can use other products. Many companies, like Tableau, want you to use their product, and they give you a great discount so that when you grow up and get a job, you will continue to use their product. Uh, I'm all in favor of this idea because it gives you what other people are using on the job. But keep in mind, it's just this one of many, many tools. PHP is a great entree into scripting, obviously. Java, I love Java programming. There's no reason why you couldn't make applets, servlets, portals, and beans in your own applications. Some people have done a great job. Raphael JS JavaScript is a free library for drawing. It's definitely worth exploring. Chart JS, Processing JS, DFJS, all of these companies are out there, some of which use open source technology underneath their own stuff. <laughs> Along the way, after we're doing toolkit and swing at this job, these here. But the big boys are right here IBM, SPSS, and SAS. This is our, so you can do all of this and build your own, but when you ramp up, you're playing with them. But sometimes you don't want to. There are tools like R, which is open source also, designed to visualize your data. So if you really want to become a good statistician, you can begin to use R, because R generates the statistical model in a way you can read it, and then visualizes it. It's kind of fun. There's also tie-ins for R, so if you have a visual, uh, you can actually write your paper, and when you generate the PDF for your paper, right. it creates the graphics on the fly, so you don't have to worry about like creating PDF and then importing right. it. It's very cool. It yeah. is very cool. Yeah. Same, same thing with PostScript, but nobody wants to go that with LaTeX and whatnot. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will. I like to crash <coughs> Google because I need to warn you, evil. <laughs> Convenience is not our substitute because what happens <coughs> otherwise. That's what's happened. Well done to assimilate kids. <laughs> One side doesn't fit all. Okay. <coughs> there we go. But also, if it's similar to the mind information retrieval, so if you're reading these topics, you're not losing anything. Um, but now there's a blurring of what library could have as no entity versus browsing. That's going away. It's now moving toward that idea of discovery. So what's being discovered? Here's a model. This is very typical in information retrieval. You have a query collection representation, a document record collection representation, a framework for matching, that's where your brain to come back in, some relevancy ranking model, of all queries and all documents, to which I add the idea of the visualization. If you can handle these five pieces, you can actually handle any system you've ever encountered and build your own system, because everybody does this. There we go. Moving quickly, more quickly, Chen, Cho Ming Chen wrote the 10 questions that are unsolved in information visualization. It's worth reading to get an idea how they're viewing the world. And as you see, what happens? Well, I still think information visualization is sort of the natural outgrowth of data mining and information retrieval. Are they different kinds? Well, it's the rise of an analytic society and quantification. There's an interesting YouTube on the notes that you may want to look at from Gary Noah Linsky. And he has sort of trivialized everything into these four main points. That's great for getting your, door, your foot into the door, but it is wrong to think that is the end of it. Sounds good? Now, everyone talks about big data. If you have big data, you have a lot of volumes of data, how big, massively big, so you have to use a visual language to interpret it. Where are these data coming from? These are non-trivial privacy questions. I, um, something I love to rant about, but I'll save it for another day. <laughs> I'll even buy the beer. Okay, there have been many attempts over the year to make fish hot graphs <coughs> in library land. OCLC tried it for a while. They kind of put them up for two months to see if anyone uses them and sort of die off the data gathering and testing. Uh, but nothing has happened yet. So there's no general model. For no general model that can match all of visualization. Um, how about recommender systems? If you've ever gone on Amazon or something like that and you look for a book, you find the image of the book and maybe 
um, a recommender system will say, have you tried these books? Other people have tried them. It's exactly the same thing. <coughs> it's finding a pattern in the data, matching it, and then representing it in a certain way. That just happens to be a very boring one. Other fields have very mature ones, because they have to use visualizations. Chemistry, mathematics, for example, are very, very well advanced. Okay, so what happens, this is where you come in again, as a librarian, a museum person, what are the influences of technological change in your job? How are you going to explain to the boss that this is a good idea, we should try this? Well, that's a bad one, don't buy that one. These are you know, decisions you make all day long. So here's part of your summary, right before I lead into the images. What should you do? Learn more. <coughs> you can't go wrong by that. And you should learn more about graphic design. Graphic design doesn't have to be boring. It should actually open your mind. Because once you begin to see the history and the development of type, color, fonts, placement, position, placement in society, you begin to see a lot more than you ever saw before. It is, it is not a waste of time. Learn the history of visual because <coughs> people love to read in the past. And then learn the software. Go ahead and break it. That's what the lab is for. <laughs> I guarantee you, I yell at my computer to this day. I've been a programmer for decades. Um, there's nobody who doesn't yell at their computer no matter how good they are. What should you learn? Learn about the data stores, relational database modeling, particularly data decomposition. It's a process of breaking down the data that you want for that function. Learn XML. <coughs> the standards, yes, but learn the concepts of XML and how they are parsed. Information retrieval, <coughs> LIS 456, get it, kids. And we don't have data mining yet, but we might incorporate this. If you can handle this, even in, at an elementary level, you can actually step in a much wider field. Let's have pep talk. Awesome. There we go. And begin to think like a system designer. Learn how to break things down into modules. And I will, here I will, shall wag my finger at the to administration. The idea of having separate portals for this and that kind of data store. Here's another data store. Here's the registrar. Here's the classes. Here's you. And then adding more and more layers of portals is the exact wrong way to go. If you say, what are these data? Oh, they're just zeros and ones, they're just little blobs. How can I put them together in a more meaningful way? Don't go up, go back to the data. I guarantee you it'll cost a lot less money, it'll improve the job, lives will be happy. <laughs> I guarantee it. Jump right in, get to know what the enemy is doing. If you are anti technology, learn what they're doing. If you're pro technology, join the club. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now what you have to do is see who's playing. The literature falls in different domains, as I suggested earlier. Industry, for example, Polygrade Publishing publishes information visualization, which used to be an in house organ for IBM. Now it's a regular journal. You have to know who's doing what. Look at the popular press in LIS, but also the popular press, um, unusual. This just came out from Harvard a uh, few days ago, making sense of big data. What it means is if people are talking about it, they're going to come to you and ask you about it. <coughs> By the way, I don't need to be so dictatorial. Embrace <laughs> Okay, hang in there, the picture's coming. Therefore, here's a summary for you guys. This is what you need to know. If they're all online, let me skip ahead. Here are some websites. This is another aspect of a visualization becoming popularized. People in the arts create stuff because it's cool, so they just put it on it. People who are trying to create visualizations have their own stuff online. And then the third party of people, like Jeff <coughs> here, called Lurkers, who watches what people are doing and talks about that. So the great springboard, springboard, and there's so many more. Now I'm going to show you a gallery just to give you some of the ideas. Okay. The time space series is the most common one. Bar charts and whatnot. You see that all the time. So you want to build from that. The idea of clustering. So in the next example, look at what you see and then reflect on yourself. What did I see? It's a good thing to do. You have to use the language that's available, color, distance, and size. These infer things. Um, and then notice how some people add extra data. Like link analysis, um, taking IP addresses, for example, the way Google does page rank, all of these are extra data that change what's going to be done. So far, so good? You, any, if you, any of you have an information uh, design background, graphic design background, you will know that you might use Illustrator to create <coughs> um, cool pictures. So these pictures are static. Books like this, which by the way is a really good book, but too expensive. Beautiful, beautiful visualization. I feel like can't wait. Mm -hmm. um, it's good to know what people talk about, but you will see many people are attempting to make the graphics over and over and over again. Katie Byrne is a really pretty book, The Atlas of Science. It's in the library. It's worth looking at. MIT Press. And you'll see why are these people making all these graphics? There don't seem to be a trend in them. So that means there's an opportunity for you to jump in. All right. Therefore, cool information graphics. Information graphics was all the rage, particularly when desktop publishing <coughs> happened when the Apple came out. And the idea was information graphics, like the newspaper, just a static image. 
but you have to know about color, obviously, and certain design principles. I'll be done, don't worry. <laughs> Gotta look at the clock, I'll be done. Um, this book is actually entirely online. It's useful to read, but it's highly abbreviated of what the big picture is. But it gives you a foot in the door, and it's free. Here is you know, one of the big gods, Dino Kine. You will notice that we talked at the beginning, I tried to talk about data in general, and information, data mining, text mining, information retrieval, information graphics, information visualization, and now we're drifting into visual analytics. And this whole world of visual analytics, data analytics, um, precision support, have all coming up again. But I think they're all pretty much the same thing. Some designs, they become more popular. Everyone can read this, do very little. Because essentially, the central design will keep here. They're just cutting the image into squares and then using circles. Wonderful book, a little more complex. Manual Lima, about complexity. Which is the same tape, but for another dimension in math. Introduction to visualization by Springer, really expensive. But this tells you how computer science world is considering the topic. And finally, what happens when all this hits the fan? You begin to make a graduate program out of it. <laughs> this is in the MFA. Excuse me, MFA. Um, oh, shoot, it's Northeastern? Northeastern does this, yeah. Northeastern Information Design and Visualization. Yeah. This tells you a lot. It does. <clears throat> There we go. There are articles, and I just put it through this information visualization challenge for the humanities. So it's not just the computing aspect of it. It's reaching over. Here are people at UCLA. They took a digital library project and cast it as a visualization project and wrote a paper on it. And here is a vision for information retrieval in information science. See, so imagine like all these bees are flying around us right now. Uh, I skipped ahead, sorry. I went too far. This chart here is to show you the idea of one, one of the most elementary visual primitives is, is a line. If you're a line, you have school reports. Once you have a line, you can begin to move the line to show different distance. So this is actually the enrollment of four classes over a third period of time in another set. But right away you'll notice the addition of that line divides this whole visual plane into something that happens kind of positively and something that happens negatively. So you'd be surprised how just a few visual elements really add meaningfulness if you slow down and think about it. How about this guy here? Imagine if you had a whole bunch of subject headings or other keywords related to some, each other somehow. Why is that in the center? That would be sort of the query, essentially. And these are representations of the document collection representation. The framework is this kind of a chart. The ranking algorithm plots them in different ways. And this is the visual language on top of it. Will you use this on the job? Are you see going to Beatley and doing that? It's an untrivial question because it's going to be even worse. Well, worse in the sense, but better, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about this guy here? You can hear the argument, well, if I globalize it, there's no language issues involved, I can show pictures. It's almost the same idea, but you see a little more free, free form. Mm -hmm. How would you begin to interpret it? You will notice. Some of you may have said, well, I see blue, I see yellow, and green. Some of you will say, well, I see a whole bunch of blobs. See, so there are interpretive opportunities to be controlled, not control, but to use. What happens if you go back to a little more uh, graphically upscale model and reintroduce that line? Well, I'm a designer and client. See two models interpreting the same data. This is essentially a systems analysis of something or a project management tool. How much time and resources will I use at the beginning, each step along the way, before I deliver the product? In the old days, we would have called this the user system diagram. But nowadays, it's a process diagram, essentially. There we go. Massachusetts. This is using real world metaphor. Everyone knows from third grade what the shape of the states look like. And if you come from Massachusetts, I don't. You probably know what a county is are, but if not, you can infer what a county is. That makes sense. Notice the color transition, a gradation. This is very common. Get from A to B. Notice up here, though, little controls. This is what turns this from an information graphic into an information visualization. The idea of maps and color spectra are useful. This is the history of slavery in the, in the year 2013. Who had the most slaves, and how do you know?
but you don't have to think that hard about it. The idea is the darker the color, there's going to be a huge difference between here and here. This is the interesting event. It draws your eye. The circle emphasizes it, and then the actual label tells you almost 14 million people. Now, I can't imagine everybody asking, how many slaves are there in India? No. There we go. Now, what happens? What is this to the web trend map? What does it look like? It looks like a, a 3D parking garage or a subway map. Okay. A subway map is a time series. How do I go from here to from A to B? As you've seen earlier, the web doesn't do it quite that way. But so the visual metaphor in this environment suggests something. And then here's that fourth dimension you see along the way. This is a really common technique. What's that? That's the world. Well, why do you think it's the world? The circles are placed such where there are there are not many or any circles where no landmass would exist if there right. were the globe. Correct. And there's no drawing of the, of the Earth underneath it. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, you only can infer it's the Earth because of the people using whatever this is being done. But what if some other phenomena were in play that never happened over here at all? You wouldn't know what it is. Second thing is, you see uh, blue and yellow gradation of color and placement, the size of a circle and the line, so you know there are relationships we talked about in this data, but is it, a, is it a useful tool? What kind of questions could you answer with this? It's a rhetorical moment. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you say, get rid of the visual noise, and put my data back again, with all the concentration of the data, put a key along here, a like series, this is growing in popularity this technique, and then do the part whole <coughs> essentially a drill down, of the most important part, and then a key to understand. This map kind of hits it all. <coughs> the balance is a little off of the white space, but it's aesthetically pleasing and it's actually informative. And easy to do computationally. Okay, this is from Chen Mei Chen and Katie Gridner. And the weird thing is, this is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. I have been racking my brain to figure out what research question is underneath that. Because this is something we were doing in 48. So what's going on? What? It is a mystery, isn't it? Okay. So here, one off. The idea of using circles, much imagery, as you'll see. The imagery abstracted is over here. When you add some labels, that's over here. And as you'll see in a minute, real world imagery plus icons. You can tell that something's going on. Uh, but notice how. I imagine the areas with no data are still pixelated. So you know that that's Africa, there's nothing there. But it could have something. So you're noticing dif dis uh, difference. <coughs> and noticing difference is a fundamental, actually mammalian, interpretive uh, way of distinguishing the events. Like a cat, you know, with little ears moving. Once it knows that the grass is there, it ignores the grass. And then focuses on the mouse sounds. We do the same thing with why I have neutral gray. Once you use lines to situate somebody, the mind sort of filters those out leaving only what's important, or what is different. Now that's kind of cool, kind of arty far thick, a t-shirt or, you know, some freshman math major's ball. <laughs> How about this? What if you get rid of the um, abstractness and you use the real Earth? You make it fun by adding idiotic technology. <laughs> <laughs> Keep looking for the Hello Kitty in there. In there. Okay, here's a line, big data. That was something that's very common. And now what do you change it? To round again. Well, someone had to make a decision between arc <coughs> or straight lines. Which is which very quickly do you think of easier to read? Arcs. Arcs. Did, you, did your eye get drawn to the lines or the arcs? Not the straight lines, but it's taking me from one point to another. Yeah. Well arcs. they do exactly the same thing, the arcs speaks more to me, but the lines look more scientific for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually award-winning in 2003. I think it's pretty, but... So your job is to think of what kind of research questions, or the why. Why should we do this? And if you figure out talent, because I really don't know. <laughs> okay? Again, what's happened when you begin wrapping up, you scale up, then you have more data again, so you have to redesign it. How can I make it more sense? Here again is another example. 
kind of pretty, lined in arc this time. So the left that we need an organizing key, as you'll see. Here we go. How about this guy? Can you imagine that for your books if you were looking for materials on Beatly? Science fiction. Well, the fun thing is you have you know, little half faces sticking in here on the side, so that the blurring visual lines essentially real imagery with suggestions. And you have circles and little circles in them, part whole relationships, a real physiology, uh, visualness. Something is being pulled out here. So whatever this is, point back up. So if you think about it, it's actually multiple of layers. Layers that present the main data, layers that are secondary data, and then tier share level, actually down here, that helps you disambiguate it. I wouldn't say it's, filled, it's settled into a rule of three yet, but it's kind of useful in a general model. Don't go too deeply, because people can't figure it out. Or well, they won't use it. Like this. That's really pretty, and it looks like something from a petri dish. It's actually not. It's um, news groups, news group links. Oh, I'm done. There's more. <laughs> this is We Will Rock You. Is it an information visualization or just some guy playing around? That's rhetorical, too. Um, <laughs> so thanks. And your job is to take a look at all the material that come to class. Ask me any questions. I'd love to know what you think, because I hope to put a, a variety of visual techniques in the library or online so you can experiment them if you want to participate in understanding how visualization could be you know, out of your world. Any questions? Thank you. I'll leave you with a wonder. What is this, and why do we have it? Kathy. But well, why? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about the ethics of this because visualization can be used to manipulate the message as much as anything, yep. even more so, I think, than, than words. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, I mean, I, I think visualization is cool, Yeah. Um, but I think that there's, I a, there's a layer there yeah. um, in terms of, I mean, look at the USA Today yeah. newspaper. They manipulate visualization all the time. If you want to know why, you know, read brief, I'll tell you why. First thing first, Tuffy does talk about the lie factor in USA Today visuals, but in at the beginning of the 19 teens, if you're lit majors, in the rise of modernism, the idea was to get away social filters that were imposed without, in order to speak directly to the mind. Um, that was a good idea at first, because uh, it opened up a whole world that led to a variety of impressions and other kind of uh, artistic forms and so uh, liberating. However, it soon became known that if you can get people not to think about something, they can be more easily manipulated. This has settled into the world of advertising. The woman I know in advertising, no, it's true, applied behavioral science. The woman I know in advertising says you can get people to buy something they don't need, but not something they don't want. So you keep it in, a back, in an effective emotional process without going to the conscious mind and making a decision, people can be easily manipulated. Well, and you can, you can use visualization to make a problem seem larger or smaller. Than it actually, than the data actually supports. Actually, uh, yes. In order to get your point of view across. Yes, and details matter. What happened the other day in the Ukraine? Russian people dressed as military were storming around Ukraine. They didn't have badges. These are people pretending to be. So they were the first line of people who wanted to manipulate it. While the Ukrainians didn't stop and look, you don't have a badge up here. And then they, then the real ones came. Um, so the, the details matter, and that's a dramatic example of manipulation through visuals. Mm -hmm. Dictators love that kind of stuff. Take a look at city design. L'Enfant designed uh, Washington, D.C., and Baron Hausmann designed Paris, not to make pretty boulevards, but to, in order to move troops more quickly. I'll leave you with another interesting aspect, if you don't mind. Take a look at the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. Magnificent architectural <coughs> piece, I think. It was actually kind of designed to save Eiffel's butt. He designed a bridge, a rail bridge, that had collapsed. And so he was kind of on the outs when it came to the engineering world. But on the political side, the monarchy was just about to come back. And the Third Republic said, we have to do something about this. And so the idea was, if we can get our act together and have a world fair with the world's largest building, the monarchists would recede. And they did. And they did. Hmm. Who knew? <laughs> um, so come to class. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I remember that I, I missed at the very beginning the definition difference. Uh -huh. um, you said that there were 
couple of things that were coming together but were still separate, uh, uh -huh. two different kinds of, kinds of visualization. The three kinds, okay. okay. Essentially, no, no, yeah. good for time's sake. Information visualization is the visualization of abstract phenomena. Okay. And, and if you want to be jokey about it, say it's thinking with pictures, literally. But now it's moving towards talking with pictures. Second thing is generally the division between information visualization and scientific visualization. Scientific visualization is representing, representing real world phenomena. But the line is blurred. If you have data that could represent a virus, for example, that you can't really see, that's inferential. If you want to show the universe, that's kind of, even though they're physical phenomena, they're too big or too small <coughs> for us to see. So that blurs the line between the two. Third part is graphic designers have gotten into information visualization because that's their general vocabulary. But the volume of data has moved from computer scientists towards visual as a solution to large amounts of data. Because the only thing you can do is in the machine. Um, but these literatures don't talk to each other. Yeah. And, and the third part of is that, that these systems are often driven by technical and commercial interests until they come down from above, like Google. So if you are part of a team, for example, to decide what system your library should have, just as you would consider buying an OPAC, so you consider what kind of visualization system might be imposed. Is that your question? Yeah. C'est bon? Well, we're, having, we're going to have class in five more minutes, so come stay. Thank you, Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry.